Thank you all for being here. We're so excited. Okay, great. So thank you all for being here. We're so excited to have our um, Affordable Housing Month event conversation with uh, Chef Brian Terry. We're very excited to kick off Affordable Housing Month May 2022 with this event. It is the first week of May, so there's plenty more events uh, during Affordable Housing Month, which is the entire month of May for you to join in and, and uh, be, become a part of. I do want to start um, before we begin in earnest with a land acknowledgement. Um, so I'd like to acknowledge the traditional uh, ancestral unceded territory of the indigenous peoples of the Moekma, Ohlone, Ramatish, and Tamian Nation, on which we are learning, working, and organizing today. We are committed to honoring and making visible the indigenous people and tribes that were intentionally displaced from their land who remain here in Silicon Valley and are a part of our community. So with that, I am Regina Celeste Williams. I'm the executive director of SME at Home. Um, and I'm so excited to be here with you all tonight. Um, this is a hybrid event. And so welcome to all of you who are in the space with us and welcome to all of you who are online as well. Thank you for joining us. And um, we appreciate your patience while we figure out what a hybrid event even is. Um, and uh, let's see, part of it is that I don't have my computer screen and so bear with me while I figure out what it all means not to be in front of a computer screen anymore. Um, but what I wanted to share with you all was that this is affordable housing month. So what that means is we have a series of educational and training events all month long for you to join with us um, to learn about housing solutions, challenges. Um, there's engaging activities for you to share with us. And it's a way for the public to get more involved, as well as for all of us in the affordable housing sector and adjacent to the affordable housing sector to um, come together and share information, share knowledge, and celebrate um, the work that we do and the, and the um, successes that we've seen. Um, it also is an opportunity for you to learn and act. So we definitely want to uh, underline the fact that we have work to do, and a lot of the work in affordable housing is about um, activism, which uh, brings us to our event tonight, um, which is very much focused around the topic of activism. I wanna highlight our sponsors for Affordable Housing Month. Um, I'm so very grateful to all of our sponsors. We have amazing partners um, who put on events throughout the month, and we have amazing sponsors who help uh, support us in putting on all of these events. But I particularly wanna highlight the sponsors for tonight, which are Meta, um, so, we're hoping that you're there with us virtually if you're not here in the space and uh, in the physical space and also Google, whose physical space we are in. Um, so they're definitely with us, but if they, if they are online, we're appreciative of you. Um, both Meta and Google are sponsors for tonight in this event. Okay, so with that, I just wanna talk a little bit about why we're here. So exciting. Um, I, I think that with this particular event, you're going to see the very clear ties between the advocacy of public policy in the affordable housing space, which is what SB at Home does, and activism and advocacy in the, in the food justice space, with, which is what Chef Brian Terry does. Um, so I have the pleasure of introducing our guest tonight. Um, before I do that, actually, I want to just talk a little bit about what we're doing tonight because I'm so excited. We're gonna have um, a cooking demonstration with Chef Terry, which is gonna be a lot of fun. Um, he's gonna teach us cooking techniques and all, all the things. Um, and then we're gonna have a little bit of a conversation between he and I, so um, get ready. We have some questions that we're gonna ask and we're gonna have a conversation. Get ready to have your own questions that you'll be able to ask of the chef. And then, probably while you're all here, we have lots of lots of books to give away, and we're going to have a book site. So I hope that you're able to stay around 
for the book signing. The book is beautiful and um, I'm sure all of the recipes and stories within it are beautiful as well. So with that, Chef Brian Terry, um, he is a James Beard and NAACP Image Award winning chef, an educator and an author. He's renowned for his activism to create a healthy, just and sustainable food system. He is the founder and editor-in-chief of Four Color Books, an imprint of Penguin Random House and Ten Speed Press. And he is co-principal and innovative innovation director of Zinni, a creative studio he founded. For the 2022-2023 academic year, Chef Bryant will be an artist, fellow, visiting scholar at UC Berkeley as a member of the second cohort of Abolition Democracy Fellows. Since 2015, he has been the chef in residence at the Museum of the African Diaspora in San Francisco, where he creates public programming at the intersection of food, farming, health, activism, art, and culture. San Francisco Magazine included Bryant among 11 smartest people in the Bay Area food scene, and Fast Company named him one of nine people who are changing the future of food. In regard to his work, Chef Bryant's mentor, Alice Watchers, says Bryant Terry knows that good food should be an everyday right and not a privilege. And um, I also want to highlight that this book, Black Food, that we're giving away tonight, as well as his other book, um, Vegetable Kingdom, are both um, books that have nominated him as a, for a James Beard Award. Um, so both books, which is like not even a thing, but it's a thing that Chef Brian Terry accomplishes. Um, and so he'll be uh, nominated for award and, and going to that ceremony in June. So it's, I don't know why he's here. We're just very blessed. <laughs> This is amazing. So I just want to say thank you for being here. And um, please help me welcome Chef Brian Terry. Absolutely. Thank you all for coming. And the reason that I'm here is because I've been thinking about and working around housing insecurity in various ways because housing insecurity and food insecurity are deeply connected, if you all are aware. Um, I want to thank SV at Home for having me. I want to thank Sonia and Antonia um, for all the work to help me get here. Um, and I'm very uh, honored to be speaking to you tonight. And look, in the spirit of full disclosure, I'm just going to let you know, my mind and my body are here. But my spirit is still in Cabo San Lucas, Mexico. <laughs> I just got back from Mexico. I was telling my wife this morning, I was like, I have, um, what, did I, what did I call it? Um, I don't know. I'm sad that I'm not on the beach anymore. I'll put it like that. <laughs> but I'm happy to be here. Margie, my maternal grandmother kept a cupboard in her kitchen that was about seven feet tall and a foot deep, each shelf crowded with glass jars full of preserves. <laughs> Pickle pears, peaches, carrots, green beans, figs, blackberry jam, sauerkraut, and her not to be forgotten chow chow. Does anybody know what chow chow is in here? Not one single person. Holy moly, we are in California. Okay, so, <laughs> so for those of you who don't know, cabbage, onions, peppers, chopped finely, uh, cooked for three to five hours, and served as a relish with leafy greens, collards, mustards, turnips, kale, dandelions. Listen, my grandmother could work magic in the kitchen. You knew she was cooking whenever you entered her house, even if you didn't smell it, because you'd always hear singing. Glory, glory, hallelujah. When I lay my burden down, burden down, no more Monday. No more Tuesday when I lay my burden down. Whenever she rolled out the dough for her fried pies, it was if her love and connection to spirit were additional ingredients that she folded in. 
I start with this memory because it's important for me to ground all the work that I do in history and memory. I always say that everything that I've been teaching over the past 20 years, I learned as a child in my paternal grandfather's urban farm. I hesitate to even call it a garden because he used every bit of available space in his backyard in South Memphis to grow food. Uh, he had hogs, he had chickens back there. Um, I think the foundation of my love for cooking came from being in the kitchen with my maternal grandmother. And so it's important as we acknowledge the land that we're on, it's important for me to acknowledge my ancestors, my blood ancestors, and their number of spiritual and intellectual um, and activist ancestors that uh, I will talk about this evening. And I just wanna make it clear I'm standing on their shoulders. And I think the most important thing that I've done throughout my body of work is help people remember, piece back these histories that I think our industrialized food system has made us forget. You know, I, it's interesting. I think there's almost this collective amnesia that I have seen when I travel around the country because oftentimes I'll, I'm gonna ask you these questions. How many of you grew up with families who had some type of agrarian roots, you know, farms in a rural area or, um, okay, two people, um, that's it? <laughs> okay, what about, um, you have family members that have had home gardens, kitchen gardens, growing some food, you know, herbs in a windowsill, tomatoes in a pot in the front porch, just somehow producing some food. What about this? Um, any of your family can pickle, preserve, you know, like putting up food for leaner times? Um, how about family members who actually made food from scratch? That thing? <laughs> so, um, and it's interesting because when I ask that question off time, I mean, look, I have kids, I can't do it like that anymore, but there was a point where I was doing like 70 to 90 events per year. Um, and it was interesting because when I asked those questions, people were raising their hands and it was almost like, Oh, yeah, I forgot that Nana had that garden. And I forgot that Mima used to pick pickle and can and all those things. So um, I, I just want to be clear that there's nothing new under the sun. And I feel like it's important for me to kind of help us put these pieces back together. So as you can see, I have a makeshift kitchen here. I mean, this is a kitchen, but there's no cooking happening back here. But I'm going to be cooking back here today. And I brought all this from home. And I really like this format for a couple reasons. One, the, the format is actually inspired by um, this event that my uh, mentor Alice Waters put together called Slow Food Nation back in 2008. I don't know if any of you remember that. It was this big event in the Presidio and it's like food vendors and farmers. And there was a kitchen that she created. It was called the Green Kitchen. And she invited a bunch of chef friends to come in. And the whole idea was that we would kind of impart these basic tips and tools around cooking. And the setup was simple. There was a cutting board, there was a, a burner. It wasn't even an induction burner. It was like some coil burner. <laughs> and then um, there was a mortar and pestle. And the idea was that we really wanted to kind of peel back and just have a simplistic way of um, showing people how to make food. I think uh, the, the ingredient that I focus on was corn. It was in the summertime and you know I talked to a lot of people and they just don't know how to pick corn and a lot of people don't know how to really like prepare it and so I told people how to go to the farmer's market and get the plumpest juiciest corn and then showed some simple techniques on how to actually prepare it. The other reason that I like working with this setup is because I think it's important to kind of honor and model the way in which we can make ourselves very simple whole foods nutritious, delicious meals without a lot of fancy equipment. I think one of the barriers that I found, you know, you talk about developing a cooking practice. A lot of people feel like, well, I don't have one of those fancy chef kitchens and I don't have a Vitamix and I don't have a Cuisinart. Like, how am I going to do all this stuff? Ah, no, I'm just not going to be gone. <laughs> um, so I, as I mentioned earlier, I kind of broke, you know, I've done work over the various years with organizations that are working towards addressing food insecurity. And we can talk about this uh, later, but we know that, well, I don't know if we all know that, but I think it's important that we recognize that communities that have very little access to healthy, fresh, affordable, and culturally appropriate food, the issue that I've been working on, this idea of food justice, ensuring that everyone has a basic human right to clean air, clean water, uh, clean soil, 
good food. Um, most often, lack of access to healthy food is simply one indicator of material deprivation in these communities. Most often, these communities are often um, also dealing with housing insecurity. They're also dealing with very few jobs. The jobs that are um, in these communities often um, don't pay a living wage. Uh, these are communities that are dealing with um, environmental racism. So often, you know, we find industries that are in these communities and adjacent to them, and they're poisoning the air and the water and the soil. I did an event at a private school in um, El Cerrito last night, and one of the people I was in conversation with, she lives in the Fruitvale. And we know that the Fruitville is sitting at the intersection of many of these issues around like lack of um, safe green space, uh, underfunded, segregated public schools, uh, lack of access to healthy, fresh, affordable food. And we know that housing is a major issue in this area. And so um, there is an organization that I work with. This is the first time that I really had to confront the reality of what it means to be living on the margins and trying to cook for yourself, right? And I think everyone should be aware of the intricacies of trying to navigate, you know, feeding oneself and just living a healthy, healthful and whole life when you're living on the margins. And there's an organization in Detroit, Michigan, um, Our Kitchen Table. And they work with food insecure communities. And I remember we visited this one woman who, you know, the, the old school coffee makers with the drip and you got the little coffee pot there and it has like the heater at the bottom to keep the coffee warm. There is a woman that I met and this was the primary cooking tool that she used. She was living in like a one room apartment and it didn't have a kitchen. So what was she doing? She was pivoting between a grill outdoors and this little coffee maker. She would make soups and stews and grains. I mean, I was impressed that someone could be so creative and inventive with so very little resources. And so it really started to help me understand the importance of simple tools like a portable induction burner. You know, you can do a lot with this. In fact, over the um, shelter in place, especially in 2020, when this is going mad because my wife was working from home, I was working from home, the kids were distance learning. I was like, I gotta get out of this house. So I was doing a lot, of, we were doing a lot of alfresco dining. And in addition to that, I was cooking outside a lot. So not just grilling, but I would literally take this portable burner, set it up next to our deck, and I would be like finishing off dishes or sauteing things. It's just like really taking advantage of this. And it, remind, it really helped me understand that, you know, this could be, because I think there's this idea sometimes. I mean, it's this really false narrative. It's, it's a very classist and often racist way in which we like to think about poor people. And, you know, oftentimes we don't feel like poor people um, deserve good food, you know? And I think that this is a tool that, we can disseminate and I think that can be very useful in helping communities that are often food insecure that may not have full kitchen to actually cook for themselves. So that's the setup. I will be making one of my favorite dishes. This is actually from my book Afro Vegan, which was published in 2014. And just to give you a little bit of, um, before I actually get into the recipe, I want to tell you a little bit about my, the arc of my work, but even before my, my work, just why did I get interested in these issues? Why am I standing before you today? And so I mentioned earlier that I come from a family who has, you know, roots in rural Mississippi and Tennessee and Arkansas, and we had farms that we owned. And obviously when my grandparents moved to the city of Memphis, where I grew up, they brought with them the agricultural knowledge, the survival instincts, the desire to grow their own food. In fact, the one thing that my paternal grandfather used to always hammer in my head every time he had me in his garden, exploiting my labor, having me shucking corn and weeding and doing all the stuff that I used to hate, but I'm so grateful that he had all the grandkids doing that now. He's always saying, if you don't, if you rely on other people to feed you, when they decide to, um, they don't want to feed you anymore, you're going to starve. And he was really about self-determination. And that was one of the things that really just helped me understand the importance of learning about the seed to table cycle and actually implementing and growing food. And one of the first things my wife and I did when we bought a house in Oakland is we built two, we built a hundred square foot raised bed in the front yard, a hundred square, square foot raised bed in the back. And we built our daughter a um, like five by seven bed that is her, her, her raised bed, her mm -hmm. fresh herbs and whatever she wants to grow in it. 
So um, that's the background. And it's important for me to like kind of put these practices of black Southerners like clearly in focus. Because I think the work that Alice Waters has done in terms of promoting kind of like the food movement, encouraging us to eat food, you know, that's local, that's seasonal, that's sustainable and organic, you know, buying, spending our dollars in alignment with our values, supporting small farmers, supporting independent artisans. I think the work that she's done is phenomenal in kind of elevating these practices. But I also think that when we uplift this privileged white woman, we erase these practices that have been the practices of people throughout history. I mean, you talk about black Southerners, we talk about indigenous populations, like people were growing food and preserving and having all these different techniques to feed themselves. And so I, my work has really been about, um, as evidenced by the title of my new book, <laughs> um, uplifting the growing, the cooking and eating practices of people throughout the African diaspora. And it really started with just like, Southern cuisine, Black food that comes from the South, but I would argue that Black African American cuisine in the South is the mock. I always talk about it as the original modern global fusion cuisine. When you think about the food that's traveled from West and Central Africa, intermingled with the indigenous foods of this land and the flavor profiles and the cooking techniques and the European influence on it. And so that has been kind of the mission of my work. But I want to tell you a little bit about. I guess the origin story of Brian Terry as a food justice activist. And I want to be clear, a lot of people who come to my work recently, they may know me because of my cookbooks or maybe they've seen me on a TV show, but my work is rooted in grassroots activism. In fact, when I was in New York City, um, I founded an organization in 2001 called Be Healthy, Build Healthy Eating and Lifestyles to Help Youth. And what we did was we worked with young people from the lower economic strata of New York. They were coming from the Bronx and Brooklyn and Queens. And we were based in this community-based center in Manhattan. But these were young people who were living in communities that are often described as food deserts. Have you guys heard that term before? To be clear, I've always had problems with that term food desert. Um, I mean, first of all, deserts are like thriving ecosystems. They're not just like barren and empty. But the, the most important thing is I think when we talk about a community as a desert, we often erase many of the practices of people who've been living there for a long time, whether they're growing their own food from, you know, bringing food from their homeland when they, you know, migrate to this country and growing that, or people who, you know, coming from the um, South who migrated, whether it's here or the urban North, people are like staying connected to their cultural food ways. Um, there have been activists on the ground for decades or longer who've been working to create thriving and healthy food systems. So the term that a lot of far left, food justice activists have largely rejected that term food desert. And the term that's been um, you know, employed in kind of lieu of that term is food apartheid. And the reason that people use this term is because when we talk about these communities, there's a history that created these so-called food deserts. There is, um, we know that there are a number of barriers that people face to accessing healthy food. It's not as if folks are just like deciding to eat at McDonald's or, you know, eat a lot of processed and packaged food. You know, people are put in positions where that's the only choice, right? There are a number of physical, economic, geographic barriers that so many communities face to accessing healthy, fresh, affordable food. And when we don't acknowledge that, it's easy for us to kind of like toe the conservative line of, well, those folks just ate better there wouldn't be so many preventable diet related illnesses or why don't people just exercise, just get off your butt and exercise without recognizing the many barriers that prevent people from you know, having these practices. So anyway, growing up, whatever food, you know, I would say like we ate our food, it was as local as our backyard or our garden, we always ate what was in season and sometimes we would literally harvest right before we had our meals. And um, you know, I got to high school and I was an athlete, I was a football player and the ethos of our team was you just got to eat as much as possible. You got to eat a lot of meat, you got to be, you got to be big as possible so you can run over people and hurt them, break their bones. That was just, 
it's coming from the coach, but he, you know, <laughs> privately, he would tell us this. And so, you know, I went off the deep end. I was eating a lot of fast food, processed food, because I was just trying to eat as much as possible. And I was eating what my buddies were eating. And it was interesting because immediately, experientially, I felt the difference in my body. I was lethargic. I remember getting acne and I was gaining weight, but not in a healthy way. And um, there was this moment where everything changed for me. And it was actually, I don't know if you all know that uh, one of the signatures of my work is that every recipe has a suggested soundtrack. And so it might be a song that inspired the dish, or maybe I just feel like you have to be listening to Miles Davis' is kind of little movie, that's kind of great, whatever it is. Uh, and then, you know, oftentimes I suggest films and books. And there are a number of reasons that I do that. But one of the primary reasons is because the thing that shifted my habits and attitudes and politics regarding food, it wasn't some heady intellectual lecture in a college classroom. It wasn't a scholarly monograph. It was a song. It was a hip hop song. We have any hip hop fans in the audience? Okay, three people. Y'all my people. All right. <laughs> Y'all my people. Well, look, I, look, trust me, you just listen to rap on the mainstream corporate control radio. I understand why you might not like rap music because a lot of that is garbage. It's like problematic. Anti-social, violent, homophobic, drug fueled, and so I get that. But I grew up in this period that's often described as the golden age of hip hop, where a lot of the music that was being produced was socially conscious and political, and it did have a big part in shaping my politics. In fact, it was a hip hop song that moved me to be an activist. And when I say activist, I mean being one of those self-righteous, dogmatic, judgmental, <laughs> and so swagging my finger, and especially to my parents, and I just apologize to them weekly for <laughs> that period of being such a jerk. Um, but you know what? That period was important for me also because as an educator, what it helped me understand is one, the most important thing when working with populations and meeting people where they are in a non-judgmental way. And secondly, um, the least effective way of widening the net or the building a bigger table is by yelling at people and screaming at them and making them wrong and telling them they're gonna go to hell because you're vegan and they eat meat even though you just stopped eating meat three days ago. So <laughs> anyway, this song, it's called Beef by one of the seminal hip hop group, uh, groups, Boogie Down Productions. And it goes a little something like this. Beef, what a relief. When will this poisonous product cease? This is another public service announcement. You can believe it or you can doubt it. Let us begin now with the cow. The way that it gets to your plate and how. The cow doesn't grow fast enough for man, so through his greed, he creates a faster plan. He has drugs to make the cow grow quicker. Through the stress, the cow gets sicker. 21 different drugs are pumped into the cow in one big lump. And just before it dies, it cries in a slaughterhouse full of germs and flies. And it gets much more graphic, so I'll stop there. But <clears throat> imagine me as some 16 year old hearing this. Because, like many of us, I was kind of convinced of the propaganda of the meat industry. And I just thought the cows are just kind of running around in the field and they go to sleep and then they end up on our plate. I had no idea about the violence. Um, that animals have to endure in our food system. And look, I just want to be clear. I don't know if y'all know, but the, the, the bulk of my body of work is actually vegan cookbooks, plant-based books. All right, you got a vegan in here? Okay. <laughs> well, look, I want to be clear that I'm not here to convince people to be vegans. That's not my thing, right? I can make arguments all day about the environmental, the economic, certainly the ethical reasons why we should all be embracing this type of diet. But in terms of health and well-being, I think it's kind of tricky when people are like, well, this is the best diet. There is no best diet. There is no perfect diet. Um, I think a lot of people like to uplift different dietary models as some panacea. But that being said, I don't know if y'all are aware that there's a growing body of research that is connecting a uh, low-fat plant-based diet with uh, prevention of many chronic illnesses, the amelioration of symptoms in many chronic illnesses, and actually uh, the Physicians Committee for Responsible Medicine, a DC-based organization, is actually building this body of works that's showing that people who are moving from the standard American diet and who are pre-diabetic or who have developed type 2 diabetes, when they make a radical shift to a low-fat vegan diet, they're actually reversing type 2 diabetes or reversing or like, you know, staving off when they're pre-diabetic. So 
what my work has been about, especially given that there's been an exponential rise in preventable diet-related illnesses among African Americans and other historically marginalized communities, is um, presenting plant-based foods as a tool, as a tool for better health, as something that I think um, people can take advantage of to be whole and healthy. Most important thing is, I think we need to be eating real food, whole foods. Look, you can be a vegan and you can have a horrible diet. You can just be going over to uh, the place where you spend your whole paycheck and buying a bunch of like crappy processed foods that are marketed as vegan, but they're not helpful. And so when I talk about, you know, eating a plant-based diet, I'm really talking about eating a plant-centered diet and kind of like moving further away from the standard American diet. So I'm going to finish the story and then I'm going to get to cooking. <laughs> um, but yeah, back to the point about why I use films and music and all these different things as a part of um, my body of work is because when I, um, after hearing that song Beef, I went to my dad and I asked him to um, give me the, the tape. Young man back there, tape is this plastic receptacle. <laughs> I'm old school. Um, but I asked my dad to give me this tape and he agreed to it first. I would go to the library and check out this book called The Jungle by this writer, Upton Sinclair. It was a novel that was written in 1906 and it was about the meatpacking industry and kind of ills of that whole industry in the Midwest in the early 20th century. And so it was a song, it was a book that moved me to do the work that I do now. That was the foundation of it. And I think that it's important to, to know that people learn in different ways, you know? Everyone isn't gonna be like the Canadian intellectual, I wanna read like this 200 page book about whatever the issue is, you know, climate chaos or factory farming or the benefits of veganism. But I'll tell you this one thing and then I'm gonna get into this. When I first started being interested in this work, I would go to these national gatherings aimed at fixing our broken food system. And I was really bothered by the fact that so often there was a lot of, there were clearly these class and educational biases that I, I was noticing in the room. Because so often the conversation would start um, with the, the, the public policies or, you know, kind of digging into the heady intellectual ideas around food systems. And that was an issue, but bigger than that, I was really bothered by the fact that the people who are most impacted by our broken food system, whether we're talking about migrant farm laborers or, you know, people living in urban centers that are often described as food deserts, they weren't in the room. These people should not have just been in the room. They should have been at the front of the room leading the conversation. Because in my mind, food justice moves beyond advocacy and direct service and not to just vilify those things. But food justice calls for organized responses that are owned and driven by those who are most impacted by food and apartheid. And so um, it was important for me to step into this work and be a voice and be a community and a partnership and help to shift power into these communities that often um, appear to be powerless, right? So let's get to this. I can tell you're tired. I know you got the after work doldrums. We're gonna get it hyped in here now, right? <laughs> So this recipe, my approach to cookbook writing, I would say is, is more inspired by visual artists, musicians, um, creative people outside of the food industry. In fact, I come from a family of musicians. My um, grandfather, my maternal grandfather, Edward, had this traveling gospel quartet, Eddie Bryant and the Four Stars of Harmony. And they were the first black group to be played on the radio in Memphis where I grew up. And because he was a musical, um, all of his children were musical as well. Um, my mom who like sings in the church choir and my late Aunt Tina, who's like a jazz singer in this small club. And then my uncle Don is like the big star of the family. He was a house songwriter for High Records, which is one of the seminal kind of like soul music labels in Memphis. Willie Mitchell, Al Green, um, and Ann Peebles, my auntie. I don't know if you guys heard this song. I can't stand the rain in my window, babe. So anyway, um, <laughs> that's Ann. And, and Don kind of like took a step back and started just mostly writing for him. So anyway, when I grew up, food and music were inseparable. Food, music, community, family, these were things that always 
were kind of integral and integrated. And I think one of the problems with our food system is that it's created food into this commodity and foods over here and all these things that are so traditionally been integrated with food, art, culture, community, family, it's way over here. So part of my work has been about building that chasm. And so, um, Romer Bearden. Does anybody know about Romer Bearden? Romer Bearden is probably one of the most important visual artists of the 20th century. And a lot of people know him from his collages, but he's bigger than that. So I would say my approach to cookbook writing is inspired primarily by Romer Bearden and some other visual artists and some hip hop producers like you know, Mad Lib, Prince Paul, uh, and others. But and to help illuminate this diasporic cuisine, I like to just cut and paste and rework flavor profiles and classic dishes and ingredients that are drawing from the past, but are also modern and looking for. Much of my work is inspired by this concept of Sankofa. It's this West African idea of looking back as we move forward. It's actually symbolized by a bird that's walking forward, but looking back with an egg kind of protected. And the idea is that as we're moving forward, we should be bringing the best practices, the traditions, the things that have served our ancestors, and that will serve us well in the future. And so um, this recipe is actually bringing together the American South and South Africa. So there is the ubiquitous slow-cooked greens that you find throughout the South, which I didn't get. When I was growing up, I was like, why the hell do you have to cook greens for four hours? <laughs> do they really need to be cooked that long for them to be like edible? <laughs> um, they weren't even green anymore, they were brown. Um, <laughs> but I later learned that when one cooks the greens in that fashion, you don't just eat the leafy green, you also have to do what? This is a quiz. If you do this, I'm gonna give you a copy of that book for free. <laughs> They're giving away for free. Uh, anybody know what you have to do in addition to eating the greens? Wash the pot liquor. You gotta drink the pot liquor. Oh. The pot liquor. Does anybody know what pot liquor is? Okay. All right. I see I'm starting from square worm you guys. <laughs> so the broth that is you know left when you are cooking these greens and simmering them. It's the nutrients, it's the goodness, all the flavor in there. You ever done hot pot? Mm -hmm. yeah, we're in Northern California, okay? It's like, it's like hot pot, right? Hot pot. You do hot pot, after you're done, like that broth is just so delicious because you've been like mixing it up. So anyway, um, this is actually slow cooked mustard greens, slow braised mustard greens, and it's topped with uh, caramelized tomato onions. So it's bringing together these kind of like <coughs> slow simmered greens that you see throughout the South and um, a South African dish, s'more tomato and onions, which is onions that have been caramelized and cooked in like a rich tomato gravy. It's used as a sauce or a condiment that you um, serve with you know, other dishes. And I'm sure you've heard because of Samin Nozrat's book or her show on Netflix, the four elements sort of that savory dish, salt, fat, acid, and heat, right? So this dish, I love this dish. When I was writing this book, I was just partying after I made this recipe because I was like, I felt so proud of myself for kind of like elevating a mundane like side dish like greens into a standout dish because what we do is the greens are sitting in that pot liquor and then that's the savory and the umami and all the depth in there. And then we top it with those onions. So it gives it some visual interest, texture, and a little bit of acid because of the tomato paste in which they're cooked. And then we finish it off with um, hot pepper vinegar for more acid and heat. And I might add a little bit of um, diced jalapeno or some type of chili. So the first thing we're gonna do, which I won't bore you with, but I will tell you how to do it. Oh, let me just say this. San Jose is not open. So I was like, oh, I'm going to wait till I get to San Jose to get mustard greens from Whole Foods. <laughs> Whole Foods didn't have mustard greens. So <laughs> what I got instead was this Swiss chard. And, you know, I'm actually glad because I always say that recipes should be used as a guide. Maybe I'm going to run myself out of business. But I think the, 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 the magic in the kitchen is creativity, spontaneity, using what's on hand. Look, if a recipe calls for mustard greens and you're growing Swiss chard in your front yard, don't go and get 
must agree. Just go harvest your sweet chard and, and use that. So I always say that, you know, recipes are a guide, but feel free to like swap out, use what's on hand, whatever makes sense. What I do say with my recipes, make it as it's written for the first time so you can at least understand what I was trying to do. And then you can do all that fun stuff. <laughs> but uh, I'm glad we have the chard. And so, uh, thanks for a chef, the uh, night chef. <laughs> I um, typically, you know, it, it depends on how I feel. It depends on what leafy green I'm using. But oftentimes I will remove the stem. Um, I don't want to cook with these. I, I like collard stems. I will often take those out chop those into small pieces and then I'll like blanch them, saute them in a little olive oil and then like put some acid on it and just serve it as a little side to give it texture. Um, with this particular dish, I don't want it to have too much texture. So I cut the, um, I, I removed the stem and then I chopped the leaves up into just bite-sized pieces. So the first thing I did was blanch them. Blanching is a cooking technique where you just, you know, boil salted um, like water and you soft it heavily and then you quickly cook uh, leafy green or fresh herb to brighten it, to take off the edge and um, to soften it. So that's what I did with this. Blanched it, if you want to, like, I don't know if you guys, have you ever been to like one of these like, uh, <laughs> like a reception and they have these crudite platters and then it's like some broccoli on there and the broccoli just looks like gray and old and weird. They should have blanched it. All they need to do is blanch it, just dip it in some boiling water and it's gonna brighten it up and make it look great. So blanch these greens. And uh, the next thing I'm gonna do is actually uh, saute them in a little bit of garlic oil, right? Do you guys, look, I know we're in the Bay Area, so you all are probably gourmands. I'm just telling you stuff you already know already. Should I just stop and we just start a conversation? <laughs> you guys got this, you like, Y'all pros, right? Okay. How many of you guys have cooked and you burned your garlic? Does that ever happen to people? Yep. Okay. That's the thing, right? So um, let me tell you, the way to avoid that, because burn, burn garlic isn't fun. There's a place for like crispy garlic. If he's in my South East cooking, but burn garlic. Once you burn the garlic, you need to get rid of it. Um, but so here's the deal. You have your fat. What the mistake that people make is they heat their fat up extra virgin olive oil in this case, they add their garlic, and then it just burns up really quickly. Once it's burned, you're done. What I want to suggest you do, rather than um, heating your fat and then adding your garlic, combining your garlic and a little bit of olive oil, or whatever fat you're using, in your skillet or your small saucepan, and then turning on your heat. That way, you can control the speed with which it cooks, right? So you're there, you're looking at it, and you're very clear about when it needs to come off. I would say for this one, when it starts to smell fragrant, when it's starting to brown, we don't need to get it um, you know, too brown. But I wanna share another tip with you. If you're ever having like a dinner party and people are coming over, as soon as like the first guests start coming over, just go get you a skillet, put you a little garlic, a little olive oil in there, Get you one of these oscillating fans. And put it, up there. it always impresses people. Just like when you have the house permeating with that garlic smell, people just love garlic smell. We have like an ice cream sundae. Like, oh my God, garlic! Um, so the thing about plant-based cooking, it's all about layering flavors. Look, I I don't even need any more, but I'm not going to sit here and pretend that stuff like fat back and lard and all that stuff tastes good. I'm not going to like, oh, I, no, that's so, no, it is delicious. But <laughs> uh, I don't eat that anymore. But the thing about that is that it's a very, it's a shortcut. It's a quick and easy way to add nutrient density and add flavor. That's why a lot of traditional Southern cooking would use these things. The thing that people often have mixed up, you know, or just these misconceptions about you know, Southern cooking, specifically black Southern cooking, which is often vilified. It's like the most unhealthy, artery clogged, and just like very misunderstood. And we could talk about that. But here's the thing. Before the industrialization of our food system, a lot of working class and working poor folks in the South, whether it's black folks or people living in, white folks living in Appalachia or whomever, folks couldn't afford to have meat at every single meal because it was cost prohibitive. Now, when the, our food system was industrialized and the prices dropped precipitously, then you could do that. But 
the way that people would often use meat on an everyday basis, it was to add flavor, it's to add nutrient density. And when you pull out like a lot of meat, it was for holidays, special occasions, and we see this in a lot of cultures throughout the world. So our garlic is simmering in here. I'm gonna add our mustard greens. And what I'm doing is just, I'm moving it around vigorously in order to coat all the greens with that delicious garlic oil. Now, before we even got to this, I should have started in this place. And I'm just gonna school you guys. So if you're cooking from a recipe, I wanna suggest this. The first thing that you do before you even think about prepping ingredients, turning on the stove, is familiarizing yourself with the recipe. Read through it. Typically there, you know, there's a title, there might be some ingredients pulled out. Um, there's a soundtrack, if you buy my books. Um, <laughs> there's like a paragraph, a head note that might put in some type of like historical or biographical or have some nutritional information. Then you have the ingredient and then you have the procedure. So the thing is, you don't wanna be getting down the recipe and you're like, oh man, I need to make this cashew green, which is a kind of plant-based alternative to heavy green. You take raw cashews, soak them overnight, blend them with water, tastes really good. Um, it's gonna throw you off your day. So familiarize yourself with the recipe, be clear about all the steps that you need to take. The second thing is, and I'm, I, this may seem chefy and fancy, I pro promise you that's not where I'm going with this, but you wanna pre-prep all your ingredients before you even start cooking. And in the culinary world, in kitchens, cooking schools, it's called the mise en place. It's French for everything in this place. And what this does is it helps you be an efficient home cook, right? In the spirit of cooking shows, once you get started, all you're doing is pulling ingredients and you're dumping and you keep it moving. You don't wanna be, oh, I gotta chop my onions up. You do this and then you gotta go over and do this. It's just wasting time. So I promise you, if you get in the habit of prepping all your ingredients before you start cooking, you're gonna feel like a pro, you're gonna feel like you should have your own show. You can say, bam, like Emerald <laughs> is really going to town. So wanna make that suggestion. All right, so our greens have been thoroughly coated with the olive oil. And then I am going to add this vegetable broth that I cooked this evening, or not this evening, this afternoon before I drove down here. And I want to say that I am a stock evangelist at this point. Now, I don't know whatever the barrier was before a long, long time. I just wasn't making stock. I just was too lazy. And I will say, I used to be this purist while I was like, oh, you know, you got to just don't avoid all those box stocks or whatever. Look, we're in a place now where you can get some really good organic box vegetarian and vegan uh, vegetable stocks and broths, or even like vegetarian vegan bouillon cubes. But making a homemade stock, I promise you, it's one of those things that when you take the time to do that, it's a great investment. And these are the ingredients of a simple stock, right? You have. Um, your allium, so I, you can use whatever kind of you want. Yellow, white, um, I typically reserve the red or purple onions for like fresh things, but you don't even need to peel the onion. Cut it in quarters, cut it in eighths. You can put it in there with the peel. Same thing with the garlic. Um, I would suggest maybe like breaking it open with buddy, like just breaking it open and maybe taking a, a knife and kind of like breaking some of the, um, the, the cloves just so that they can actually like open up. Um, I like to use some cabbage, Napa, Savoy, whatever you want. I'll typically use a couple of carrots. The thing about the carrots is you don't want to use too many because they can make your stock really sweet. You're making a creamy carrot soup, great. But if you have a, a soup or stew or whatever you're trying to use stock for, you don't want too much sweetness, don't use too many carrots. I also suggest peeling the carrots uh, because oftentimes the peel has some bitter flavor. So do that, a couple celery sticks, I'll add some mushrooms to give it that depth and umami. And then um, some bay leaves, maybe some fresh herbs, some thyme, some parsley. You guys know what this is? Oh, we got somebody from the Caribbean up here? No, this is, I wish, I mean, you get them so easily. This is a, it's a habanero. Cousin of a stock, stock one. But I want to just, I don't necessarily do this with stocks, but I just want to share this tip with you. If you're making a soup or a stew, throw a habanero in there. Now, the key is 
you want to make sure it's intact and you don't take the stem off because you know that's where all the heat is inside with the seeds and the, the, um, the what do you call it, the ribs. You put this in here, it's going to add a lot of flavor and body to your super stew. But the key is you need to keep it at the center because you bring it to an oil, it's probably going to pop and then you're going to have like a fire hot <laughs> stew. Or so I did the other, I forgot that I turned to oil and brought it down and I just ruined this stew that I did. And, I, I went to college in New Orleans, so I could do heat, but I couldn't do that. So don't do that. But I just want to give you that tip. So all you need to do, put everything in your stock pot, bring it to a, add a couple quarts of water, bring it to a boil, lower that to a simmer. And then um, after that, let it cook for about an hour and a half, drain it, press the solids down, and you have like a really rich vegetable stock. This is something that we do. My wife and I try to like do a lot of pre-prepping on the weekends so that it makes it easier uh, during the week when we're making meals for ourselves and the kids. We will often make a big thing of stock every weekend, cool it down, pour it into ice trays, freeze it, break those ice trays open, add those to like some Ziploc bags, and you have these ready-made cubes of stock. Obviously, you can use it for like soups and stews, but for example, when you're making a grain-based dish, quinoa, rice, onion, Water works, but if you add stock, it's just going to add more flavor and depth. So stock cubes. Get you some stock cubes in your life. All right. So our um, greens, we're going to just pretend they're simmering. We're going to pretend like I have a full kitchen with more than one little eye or so. Um, the next thing I'm going to do, we'll go really quickly because I want to be in conversation and talk to you guys some more about some other things. But really quickly, um, the way that we prepare these onions is we just want to caramelize it. And this is one of those things where, I mean, this whole recipe, in fact, if you could boil a pot of water, you could make this recipe easy. And I try to like, you know, one of the things I like to do in, in the spirit of this demonstration now is I try to write recipes that give the reader, the home cook skills that they can take beyond that recipe, that they can add to their overall cooking repertoire. So with this one, we're going to caramelize onions. Now, do you guys caramelize onions at home? Is that something that feels good? Yeah. Okay. So caramelizing onions is simply cooking them over medium, medium low heat for an extended period of time in order to bring out the natural sweetness in the onions, right? Adds more flavor, adds more depth. And I want to say, you know, they're very, just kind of going back to the stock, there are variations that you can do. So like in the wintertime, I might do a rich vegetable stock where I actually take like more, uh, you know, I'll take the vegetables and then I'll like chop them up and then I'll roast them. I'll roast them in the oven to bring out some of that flavor and depth. And then I'll go through the process of like boiling them, pressing them. So it's much richer. I'll do a root vegetable stock. Where I'm just doing like, you know, carrots and rutabaga and parsnips. So... There are a number of variations of stock you can do. This is just the most basic one. So with our onions, we just want to move them around vigorously. And we just want to let these cook until the natural sweetness starts to come out. I'll tell you something that incenses me. I don't like it when people put sugar in their onions when they're trying to caramelize them. I'm like, you're defeating the purpose. That's the point of caramelizing is bringing out the natural sugar. It's a weird shortcut. Um, but I think that's because people are in a hurry. And one of the things that I often encourage people to do is looking at the time spent in the kitchen cooking. If you have the time on weekends, on holidays, as a way to practice mindfulness, right? Just like being present with the process, like not feeling any rush. With caramelized onions, you could do these for 15 minutes. I mean, sometimes I'll cook them up to 30 minutes just to really bring out a lot of that natural sweetness, right? So we're doing this quickly, but let's just imagine that this has been, these have been caramelized for like 15 minutes. And the next thing I know, I know I'm just like, Making fun of people add sugar to the carbon onion. We're gonna add some sugar, but it's because when I was testing this recipe, I found that adding a little more sweetness brought some balance to it. So it's really about that, and not just kind of like doing a little shortcut. So I'm adding some raw organic sugar. It's like between one to two te teaspoons of it, and then we'll move that around. And then we want to add our tomato paste. 
Um, this is some double concentrated tomato paste. I like the Italian kind. Um, maybe like one to one and a half teaspoons. The recipe calls for three whole onions that have been, um, you know, cut in half, move the moon, and then just like the you know, full rounds. And then I use like three tablespoons of the tomato paste. And then I add a little bit of water if they need to, just to kind of loosen them up. And so what this will yield, I mean, I did it, I pre-did some, it's the same thing, but it looks like this, all right? <laughs> so uh, in this particular dish, uh, as I mentioned, we finish it off, I mean, I'll show you. This is what it looks like. We're not gonna do anything. I wish I could be like, uh, like hey, voila! <laughs> it's not going down like this. So this is what it looks like. This is from the, the French version of Afro Vegan. Afro Vegan. Um, they decided to use that image for the cover of the book, which I was really excited about. It's my favorite recipe. So I am going to move these back here, and then I'm going to invite Regina, and we can have a conversation. And while I'm doing this, I will simmer these greens. And then I'm going to eat them because in COVID times, I do not serve samples. You're not going to sue me. <laughs> well, first, first of all, I want to say I'm definitely cooking this recipe. From now on, this is what my greens will look like. So if any of my family are watching and I told them to watch, this is what we're going to be serving um, at the next family get together. So I appreciate you sharing with us. Um, so I think what we'll do is I will actually check and see if anyone has any questions. Yeah, sure. And then if you don't have questions, I have lots of questions. But I have a feeling that we're going to have to put the audience. And then Julie, you'll let me know if you have any from online. Okay, yeah, great. Please, I, I invite any questions about techniques, about whatever you want to ask about. Just don't get too personal. So yeah, <laughs> yes. Um, when making stock, so with all the solids at the end, is there anything useful you do with that or do you just throw it away? Or is it like the good chicken feed or is it comp being composted? Oh yeah, I just compost. Okay. Yeah, so um, she was asking about all the solids that are left over after pressing the um, liquid out before it stop. <laughs> put in the compost. Mm -hmm. I mean, I hope you have compost at home. <laughs> just put it in the green bin. So. Anyone else? Any more questions? Did you have one? Yes. So you mentioned about your diet and switching over to a plant-based diet. So how was that with your family? And then when it comes to uh, family cooking, um, would we have family members that live in low access communities or as you call it, food apartheid communities? How do you convince them to cook in a healthier direction for us? So um, to answer your first question, I always talk about moving to a plant-based diet as a journey. And just in general, I, I really, in my own life, I'll, I'll talk about that, and I encourage my, my daughters to do this, is to be clear about goals, to develop goals. But I think sometimes when we get so goal-oriented, we miss out on the journey, right? And it's important for me to be as present with the journey as it is in reaching a destination. And so with my destination or with my journey towards, you know, my plant-based journey, if you will, it wasn't a linear journey. You know, I started like taking out animal products and then there were periods where I was like a strict vegan. And then when I was at um, the whatever, like, what was it? The first semester of my senior year, I was studying abroad in France. This was in the late 90s. Wasn't no being a vegan in, in France in the late night. <laughs> and so I was like, I'm staying with a host family and eating yogurt, cheese, and fish. And mm -hmm. I was just kind of adopted to the culture and I wasn't a strict vegan. I was, as, you know, as much as I could be, but it was much more difficult to have a strict vegan diet. And I thought it would be rude and I thought I would probably come off as an asshole if I was just saying, I don't want to eat all this food that you guys are giving me as you're letting me live in your home for <laughs> six months or whatever. So, you know, I, I, and I, I say that because, I, you know, I kind of jokingly talked about being this self-righteous vegan when I first moved towards that. And I think, unfortunately, people who eat in that way, 
they get a bad rap because a lot of people do come across as that. And I think it's natural. You know, the thing is, like when I look at my own journey or even like it's interesting because my daughter, like I, I, I was very clear that I didn't want to be too strict about like too prescriptive about the way that she ate. You know, I don't want her to be a strict diet. My wife is an omnivore. Um, she was a, a, a vegan until she got pregnant and she turned to a table. But um, <laughs> so she was eating animal products sometimes. And so I just didn't want to be too like stringent about like, you need to be a vegan. But I would talk to her about my journey and read her age appropriate books about, you know, veganism. And then maybe like two years ago on her own, on her own accord, she's like, I want to be a vegan. And she's like a hardcore, strict, militant vegan. Like she's not eating anything, any like animal products or no kids or anything in there. How old is she? She's 11. Oh, wow. She just started 11 last week. And so, um, and so, so, you know, I just think that from my experience, I just want to give people the opportunity to like step into eating more. Because I also think that people, when they think about eating a vegan diet, they always think about it as a deficit. Like, oh, I'm not getting to eat all these things. And the reason I wrote Vegetable Kingdom, it was so that I can help people understand the, the abundance in the plant kingdom and the way in which you know, you don't have to eat like all these fake meat burgers and all this, but you can actually eat plants that are cooked well and executed deliciously and then have a very fulfilling diet. So to your second question, I'll tell you this. One of the reasons, so, I, so let me just tell you this little story. I was actually a doctoral student in history at NYU. And part of the reason that I started pivoting into this food work is because I was doing some research on the Black Panther Party for self defense. You know, you guys know who they are, right? Yes. Black Panther Party for self defense. I always use like, that full name because colloquially we know them as Black Panthers. But they started as the Black Panther Party for self defense. Why? Because in Oakland, police were coming into Black communities, they were violating the rights of citizens, and in some cases they were murdering Black folks. So the Black Panther Party for self defense formed initially to police the police to ensure that they weren't violating the rights and killing black folks in the Bay Area. And so um, I knew that there were more than the kind of way in which the popular media has painted them as just some like angry gun-toting militants. But I didn't really know the extent to which they were doing like a lot of powerful and meaningful programs in communities. They had over 60 programs under the rubric of their survival programs. I don't know if you guys have heard of these. They were doing all these things because what they found is that yeah, police violence was a reality. And as we mentioned earlier, when you look at these communities that have dealt with historical oppression, there are so many levels of material deprivation and oppression that communities are dealing with. They're just like, people are dealing with like medical apartheid, food apartheid, you know, lack of transportation. What can we do to help support communities? So they were like having services where they would take elderly people to their doctor's appointments. They would have ambulance services in emergency situations to get people to the hospital. They were um, doing things like sickle cell anemia testing, because we know this is a disease that mostly impacts people of African descent. So surprise, there isn't a lot of research going into it. And so um, they had two programs that sat at the intersection or addressed this intersection of poverty, malnutrition, and institutional racism. They had their grocery giveaways, where they were literally doing like mutual aid, giving people food who are living on the margins, bags of groceries. And the program that they had that inspired my work and moved me more than anything was their free breakfast for children program. I'm sure some of you have heard of this program. Started in 1968 in Oakland with the help of a reverend in West Oakland, California. Within one year, the program spread to every major city that had a Black Panther chapter. They were feeding over 10,000 young people every single morning. Right, this was grassroots activism and its finest. Right, really being clear about the needs of people in communities and responding programmatically. And so, that was a kind of inspiration for my work. Um, and so, I founded this organization called Be Help. I left grad school um, after three years with my master's, made my parents just mad. They were like, What? You're leaving it? We spent all oh, 12 years of private school and you're going to cooking school. Um, <laughs> and um, yeah, they didn't get it at first, but now they get it. <clears throat> this boy's been killing it. But um, anyway, 
I went into this cooking school with a clear vision of using food and cooking as a way to politicize young people. Because when I think about, as a historian, and I look at many of the powerful social movements of the 20th century, from this anti-apartheid movement in South Africa to the civil rights movement in America South, with young people, their bravery, their brilliance, their great ideas, their ability to put everything on the line and help push these movements forward. And so I knew that in order for this movement around food justice, around creating more equitable and healthy and just food systems, we had to have young people at the lead and young people who are living in the communities that are dealing with food apartheid, right? Because they understand their realities. The thing is, most people who are living in communities, they understand the problems and many people are actually creating solutions to address the problems, right? But what's needed are power and resources so that it can do the work well. The, the least effective way of doing it is having some snow-capped NGO come in and say, this is how you should fix your community, which happens all too often. You know, it's really doubling down on oppression. But anyway, um, we would work with these young people from the Lower Economic Strata of New York City. We would bring them to the door where we were based. And the first year of our program was really about just helping them fall in love with growing food and cooking food and eating real food because so many of them had been living in neighborhoods where they, they were replete with, you know, places to get a lot of fast food, and processed food, and packaged food. In fact, the, the moment that I was like, I need to be doing this work was when I was riding the subway at 7.30 in the morning to go TA a class in the village. I was riding a train from Brooklyn and I saw these kids across the subway and they were eating powdery donuts and red hot Cheetos mm -hmm. and drinking sodas and energy drinks and sugary juices. And I was just clear that the work that the Black Panthers were doing now was back in the 60s was just as relevant because they were, my mentor, Raj Patel, um, says stuffed and starved. They were eating a lot of um, edible food-like substances, as Michael Pollan calls them, but these weren't the foods that had the nutrients, the, 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 the everything that young people, I mean, that any of us need, but especially young people whose minds and bodies are developing. And we know now, there's a body of research that connects you know, nutrition with better educational outcomes, better um, behavior outcomes. And that's what the Black Panthers knew back then. They knew that young people couldn't go to school when they were hungry, because how are you gonna possibly like focus when you're having hunger pains? But we know that when you're well-fed and you're settled, you can like absorb the information and learn and, and just be more present in that uh, environment. So, and I'll wrap this up. When we took these young people to rural farms and community gardens and urban farms and food co-ops, but specifically to places where people are growing food, that we helped them experientially learn about the seeds table cycle because we would do these things where we would go to organizations who were working on urban agriculture and at farms in rural areas, and we would have them work with our young people and teach them when they would harvest food from the ground and then they brought it back to the door where we were based and then they cooked those raw vegetables and made these dishes. I don't care what, I mean, whatever, like, uh, let me think, quinoa with goat cheese and roasted beef, something that in no other circumstance they probably would have had any interest in because they made it, they tried it. And the more that they tried diverse vegetables and grains and, you know, nuts and seeds and fruits, stuff that they weren't eating on a regular basis, the more that they opened up their palates. And then they would often say, like, oh, you know what, man, I just, when I eat XYZ that we just cooked, I feel so much more energized. I feel like I have like this long energy and I could just, you know, go and attack the day. Whereas when they were eating a lot of the processed and packaged foods, they knew that it was like a real spike and then they crash. And so that was the way that we helped them get invested in changing their own habits and attitudes and politics and connection with food. And then they could then go back into the communities and be leaders. Now we know that there are like a lot of steps that take place beyond that because you need to like create avenues of access, you need to get people involved. But I found that, and that's why I started writing cookbooks because I knew that a lot of people weren't cooking. And I knew that if we can get people in love with cooking real food again, then that could be a powerful way to build the base for this food justice movement. That's so good. Um, okay. Oh, we have some online questions? We have a question on Zoom. Okay. Um, hello, Chef. I love your book and I love your recipes. I love that you use Gerberate. I don't know. Bam, bam. 
in it's your a, it's, Yeah, it's like red, red bag is like the uh, kind of like the cortisol spice blend of Ethiopian and Eritrean mm. cooking. So the, uh, in your black eyed pea sliders, I use them when making Ethiopian dishes. Were you inspired by injera when using the spice? Injera? I N J. Oh, yeah, was not inspired by injera. I was just inspired by uh, Ethiopian cooking. I, my, I had a girlfriend in high school who was Ethiopian, and First time I ever ate at her family's house, I was like, what the hell am I missing? <laughs> and so, um, yeah, I, I have an affinity for Ethiopian food. And then, you know, in the East Bay, there are like dozens of Ethiopian restaurants, some better than others. But you, if you want good Ethiopian food outside of Addis Ababa in D.C., you go to Oakland and you go to Oakland and Berkeley. Amazing. So um, yeah, I, I I love that band. I use it in like the sliders, but sometimes I'll just make popcorn and sprinkle like bam bam and popcorn with some olive oil. So yeah. Thank you. I think we had another audience question. Yes. yes. Um, this was amazing. And so I have two questions. One's brief, the other one's a little more complex. But hypothetically, like, I just want to say I love Nowhere in any other city, like when I'm in the Bay Area, and they're like, I'm gonna ask you a question. But first of all, <laughs> not with you, but I probably like, I like it before it I say no. <laughs> um, hypothetically, let's say like I couldn't cook, right? But my wife could cook really well. What advice would you give me to convince her to never ask me to cook? <laughs> <laughs> The real question. The real question. Thank you. Like, yeah, okay. okay, what's the real question? The real question. Um, so in, in your, your food justice work, what what do you how do you uh, I guess inspire or, or, or do you speak to communities that are uh, dealing with food challenges and food part diet? How do you talk to them? Moving from a deficit model to help them see kind of what they do have at their disposal and help them kind of shift any habits that you may see that might be in. Sure. I mean, I think one big piece of that is just helping people understand structurally why certain communities look the way they do. You know, we talk about like this investment. We talk about, I mean, the thing is, like a lot of the communities that are like described as food deserts, like there was a process. I mean, it wasn't like these communities always looked like that. You know, a lot of this has to do with white flight, people, white people moving to the suburbs, and then like these city centers, they kind of starved with resources because the power, the political will wasn't there anymore. And so then you had a lot of businesses that decided, well, there's not like a, there's no reason for me to, I'm gonna go where the tax base stronger where people have more income and so a lot of the kind of like these places i talked to my grandparents and they like even their neighborhood um south memphis tennessee where i grew up it was kind of like starting to teeter on that kind of community but when i talked to them they talked about like farm trucks and independently owned grocery stores and all these things and things started to shift when you have this economic class white flight. So I think it's important for people to just in general, just to know history and to know how things got to be a certain way. But I think that helping people understand that they're powerful is is as much as we like to look at these communities through the lens of a, you know deficiency, people are power. Like people are powerful just because they don't have like financial resources, that doesn't take away from their power. And there are a lot of individuals and organizations just on the food tip who've been in these communities and who've been working to address food insecurity for decades or longer. You know, you can just talk about the master gardeners and people who come from the South and have all this agrarian knowledge or people coming from, you know, different parts of the world and they come from agrarian um, backgrounds. They have this um, brilliance that just needs to be tapped into because maybe they're just doing it for their family. But what, what would it look like if they shared those knowledge and skills with the wider community so that then everyone in that community could then contribute to these kind of robust food systems? I think one of the big, you know, I'll, I'll tell you what my 
I used to talk about the three C's of change, right? Because I'll tell you what I have a problem with. I mean, look, I, having done this work for two decades, it's so exciting to me to now see that people are like, oh, I'm gonna go to the farmer's market or you know, even like understanding what like fair trade is. I'm gonna try to get fair trade products. So just having more like fluency around kind of like spending in alignment with their values, spending in a way that's more sustainable for their health, for the earth. But what I've found is that so often people will kind of stop at that individual change, right? Because I think a lot of people feel like consumer action is enough, right? I don't know if you guys feel like this, but some people seriously feel like if I just go to Whole Foods and I get organic produce, then I'm doing my job. And maybe you are for yourself, for, for people who have you know resources, but what about the people who don't? And so, look, I'm going to always celebrate people who are like, I think every dollar that we spend is a vote for the type of food system that we want to see, right? Uh, if you're spending your dollar at the farmer's market, typically those farmers get 90 cents on every dollar that you spend. Whereas when you go to these corporate-owned supermarkets, whether it's Home Paycheck or Walmart or whatever, the bulk of the money is going to, I mean, first of all, a lot of the, the, the money is going to towards what economists call external costs. Marketing and shipping and all these things that don't have anything to do with like paying small to mid-sized farmers. And you know, Malcolm X, he would talk about when he was talking about kind of like the need for black people to support black businesses, he said that when you support people who don't live in your community, at the end of the day, that man takes that bag of money back to his community, right? And I think in terms of like food we need to be thinking about economics and empowering communities and so so often in a lot of historically marginalized communities as soon as people bring money in it goes right back out they're spending at these multinational corporations but ideally it should continue to circulate in the community and like the reality is that our food system is largely controlled by a handful like five multinational corporations largely control our food system. We have to push back against that because they are making all the decisions. Because guess what? When you have that much power that's concentrated at the top, these companies have very little stake in addressing uh, labor issues. They don't have any stake in addressing environmental issues. They don't have any stake certainly in address, addressing um, you know, ethical issues with like animals and how they treat them badly. So all that to say is, Consumer action is great, spend it on your values, but don't stop there. So then I say the second C is community. How can we engage with our community? How can we be a part of those community gardens and those food co-ops and all those systems that people put in place to care for and ensure that you know, people in communities are well taken care of? Um, and that might mean just donating. You know what I mean? I had to reimagine what activism was like because honestly, one of the hardest things that I had to do as in this career uh, was shut down Be Healthy, the organization I founded, right? And part of it is because, you know, when, when we were founded, like I was invited to come out here in the summer of 2003. And the first week I was living in Berkeley and I was like, oh, forget New York, I'm moving to the Bay Area. But I knew that we were such a young organization that I couldn't leave it and hand it off. So it was a decision about do I want to live in the Bay Area and be happy with all the people living in New York and be all like bad because it's like subway. <laughs> so I shut the organization down. But then I was having problems, like these internal conflicts around writing books because I felt like, oh man, writing books is some bourgeoisie like practice. Like I need to be in the streets. You know, I'm an activist. I need to be in the streets fighting a good fight. But then I had to like check myself because my own narrow way of thinking about activism. Activism means like being on the ground, confrontation of protests, and that is the important part of pushing back against power. But activism could be me writing books and like changing people's thoughts around food. Activism could be like wealthy people donating their money, like giving up some of their resources to ensure that organizations like SV at Home can do the important work that they're doing. And so, um, you know, whether it's supporting community organizations in whatever way you can, or just like being out there in, in, in the community doing the work, I think that needs to happen. The third C is how do we engage as citizens? We know that so many of these inequities are built into public policy, so we need to be like using our votes and ensuring that we're putting official public officials in office 
we're going to make decisions in the best interest of regular people and not just the big corporations. But I want to be honest with you, this is this is new. This is pre-pandemic. I used to talk about the three C's, and like over the past two years, I think given the enough response of the U.S. government uh, with this public health crisis, given the further widening of the wealth gap, the further concentration of wealth, people feeling like we just where are our tax dollars going? We know they're going to the military budget, but like, shouldn't we be getting taken care of? Shouldn't we have been getting like checks back in February, March, 2020, so that people can actually like be home and not have to be out here getting sick and dying? And so a lot of people, and I'm going to tell you, just like doing events, and traveling and talking to people, a lot of people are just like, it's over. Capitalism isn't going to save us. The U.S. government isn't going to save us. What's going to save us is us. So a lot more people are creating alternative systems, whether it's like buying up land, creating food co-ops, creating systems that don't rely on fiat currency so that we can actually be whole and healthy and not just be constantly under this illusion that we just work hard enough, everything's gonna like fix itself. That's not the case. Because people, poor and working class people, work their asses off and they're still in the same economic position. So. I, I say that to say that a lot of people are fed up and they're still like these systems that we've been hoping would that we can rely on. I think people are just like, clearly, that's not the case because of the past two years. So I, I have to say, I feel like you literally covered our whole affordable housing month in one session. So I just <laughs> thank you so much. We touched on so many things. Um, I think it's a good time to wrap up because you talked about reimagining activism and that's what we're trying to do this month in affordable housing month is reimagining home and what it means to be involved, what it means to be an advocate, what it means to affect change. Um, so I just want to thank all of you. I want to thank Chef Brian Terry. I want to thank all of our sponsors. I have a burning question. Oh, can, can I burn? Is, 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 is it okay <laughs> if we wrap up this hybrid session yes. and we start the book signing? Because I think a lot of folks want to get their books and a okay. lot of people want to get them signed and have a chance to have um, a little bit of. Can you just answer real quick? Because maybe there's something that people out there. Oh, I'll real quick. I'll answer. Quickly. So I'm with the Lived Experience Advisory Board, um, current and former homeless individuals out here in Silicon Valley. Um, I organize and provide services with the homeless doing outreach. And I'm wondering how can we get healthy meals to people? Um, and, you, and I know you were saying in a way that it's better to empower people so they're doing it themselves. How can we empower people who are currently unhoused? And I know it would be nice to just give them housing so they can have a garden in their backyard, but. I, I'd say look for organizations in the local community that are doing it. There are probably some folks who are already doing it. And so, and, and that's the thing, like, going back to this point around people who've been on the ground doing it, you don't need to invent, reinvent the wheel. Do you guys watch Atlanta? Michelle? <laughs> Did y'all see that episode with the uh, woman who created that, uh, ni that, that Nigerian food truck? <laughs> Y'all been watching the season? Y'all haven't been watching the season? Oh, jeez, I'm sorry. I'm like, I'm sorry. 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 I'm sorry. But this new season. Anyway, um, I guess my point is, is that, you know, we don't need to, if the work is already happening and their best practices out there, I think it's about either like supporting that work or learning from the people who've been doing it so that we can like maybe adapt it to make sense for our geographic area or the community that we're working in. So I say start there, just see what's happening. But even if it's not happening here, other parts of the country, look for those models and then think about how we might be able to collaborate with stakeholders in this area and actually implement some parts, if not wholesale, replicate those models. Right. So I start there. Okay, yeah. thank you. I appreciate you. I appreciate you for taking another question. So again, I'd like to move to the next portion. So we'll say um, thank you to the folks online and we'll close that out and then we'll go ahead and move to the book signing. So please help me in thanking Chef.